Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, konnichiwa, watashi wa Tokyo College de koen suru koto ga dekite totemo koe desu. I am grateful to Professor Haneda for the once in a lifetime opportunity to, to provide this lecture, uh, this public lecture at the Tokyo College. The Tokyo College was established to promote interdisciplinary collaborations to gain deeper knowledge and understanding. Today's talk will focus on the global pandemic of kidney disease, its impact on global health, and how we must address this global burden that affects over 850 million people worldwide. I'd like to start with a quote from a patient. My health today is a direct effect of the care that I received yesterday. For the medical students in the audience, what I often try to do is link a patient with everything that I do, whether it's teaching, whether it's patient care, or whether it's research. The patient is always central to what I do. So today I'd like to talk about the global burden of kidney disease, kidney failure, health policy, landmark studies in nephrology, and transforming kidney research, discovery, and innovation. Now it's important to realize that the kidney disease is silent. It has many different functions. It has an endocrine function, that is it makes hormones to maintain bone health. It also works to keep our hematocrit normal, and it keeps us from be becoming anemic. It also rids our body of metabolic waste products. It's involved in drug metabolism, so medications that we take, the kidneys metabolize and gets rid of it. It's involved in the control of solutes and electrolytes. And in addition, it's very critical to, for, the, for the maintenance of blood pressure. And lastly, it's involved in maintaining acid-base balance in our body. Now, in many individuals worldwide, the kidneys become damaged, and they end up becoming chronic, chronically fibrosed, and we end up having chronic kidney disease. There are a number of different conditions that cause chronic kidney disease, such as diabetes, hypertension, chronic glomerulonephritis, and polycystic kidney disease. But it's important to realize that kidney disease is silent. So despite the fact that the kidneys look terrible, you may not know that you have kidney disease. 850 million people worldwide have kidney disease. So look around the room and count nine people and one of those nine people in this room will have kidney disease. Mostly women, then men. So if we go back, 850 million people have kidney disease. That's twice the number of people with diabetes. That's 20 times the number of people with cancer and 20 times the number of people with HIV or AIDS. In Japan, there are 13 million people with kidney disease. That's one in eight. And in terms of dialysis, 300,000 patients have, are on dialysis or have been transplanted. Now, if we look at the global impact of chronic kidney disease, this is information from the Global Burden of Disease Work Group. And this, uh, <coughs> there are 250 predicted leading causes of death, and they are listed, and the top 29 are listed. And as you can see from 2016 and projected to 2040, what you'll notice is that the top three will remain the top three in 2040. But if you look at the next eight or so, you can see that many of them will decrease by the year 2040. But chronic kidney disease, you can see, will advance to the top five by 2040. So chronic kidney disease is an important part of uh, the health burden today. It's going to become even greater in 2040. 
Now, the incidence of ESRD, ESRD is when kidneys fail and you become, uh, it becomes necessary to be on dialysis or transplanted. The incidence of ESRD is a global problem. And of the 10 top countries, seven out of 10 are from Asia. And if you look at the, rapid, the rate of rise, you can see that the rate of rise is rapid in Asian countries. If we look at the incidence or the prevalence of kidney failure in Japan, that is those that, re that are on dialysis or those that have received transplantation, you can see that it continues to be a growing problem just like in the United States, mostly in patients that are over the age of 50 or 60. And if we look at the, uh, the top four causes of kidney failure in Japan, it's diabetes, chronic glomerulonephritis, nephrosclerosis, usually from hypertension, and polycystic kidney disease. But what's interesting is that although glomerulonephritis is an important cause of kidney failure in Japan, it's gonna decrease in importance compared to diabetes. Diabetic kidney disease is gonna to continue to rise in Japan. And what's fueling chronic kidney disease? Well, it's diabetes and, diabetes and obesity worldwide. In the United States, obesity has become a major problem, and secondarily, diabetes um, has become a problem, and, uh, and, and subsequent chronic kidney disease. But in Japan, it's a little bit different. Obesity is not much of a problem, yet diabetes and kidney disease is a problem. So why is that? Why, why is it that, um, that uh, in Japanese, you get chronic kidney disease from diabetes, but the diabetes is not due to obesity. It's probably due to other metabolic causes, maybe genetic causes, but that remains to be seen. What's really, really important is that the awareness of chronic kidney disease is very poor among the general population. 30% of patients and different uh, uh, racial categories have chronic kidney disease. But only about less than 10% of this group is aware of that the fact that they have kidney disease. So 90% are unaware that they have kidney disease. Only 10% know that they have kidney disease. And what's even more striking is that 30% of those with severe kidney disease have never even seen a kidney specialist. Now, there are sex differences in kidney disease. And shown to the left is the prevalence of chronic kidney disease that are it's moderate to severe. And what you'll notice, and it's not necessary to see all the details, but the blue bars represent males, and the red bars represent females. What's interesting is that females outnumber the males in terms of chronic kidney disease. The only two countries that seem to be reversed, that is males greater than females, is Singapore and Japan. Why that is, it's not clear. What is, what is known, though, is that the lifetime risk of renal replacement therapy, shown here, is greater in males than females. So what happens is, is that males progress faster towards um, dialysis as opposed to females. Why is that? Well, it may be because of hormonal differences, because of sex differences, but it also may be due to um, lifestyles of, the, of males that may be riskier than females. There are sex differences throughout the continuing continuum of chronic kidney disease in terms of access to medical care, chronic kidney disease, chronic dialysis, and kidney transplantation. If we look at the access to kidney, uh, to medical care, the access is less in women than men. If we look at different kinds of disorders, autoimmune diseases, for instance, affect more women than men, and subsequently they develop chronic kidney disease. Fewer women than men are on dialysis, and women are less likely to be kidney transplant recipients. Rather, they are more likely to be donors. 
What I'd like to do over the next few minutes is talk about kidney failure and health policy. Kidney failure in the United States that requires dialysis is often regulated by the government. And health policy is important in regulating uh, dialysis in this population. There are essentially three kinds of treatment options for patients who have reached end-stage renal disease. Hemodialysis is one shown on the left in which blood goes into an artificial kidney and then it's returned back to the patient. This occurs three times per week, about four hours for each treatment. Peritoneal dialysis is when uh, the dialysis solution, which is a physiological solution, is infused into the peritoneal cavity. It sits there for about six hours, and then it's drained out. During that six hours, though, it's extracting a lot of the metabolic waste products and correcting acid-base problems. There are four exchanges per day and seven days per week. This can be done at home. And then there's kidney transplant, in which there's uh, kidneys that are donated, either from uh, a living related or living unrelated uh, person. Uh, it can also be provided by a deceased donor. Now, Dr. Willem Kolf is considered the father of dialysis. This is a Dutch physician who constructed the first artificial kidney in 1943. Over the next two years, he treated 16 patients with acute kidney failure with little success. But in 1945, a woman in uremic coma regained consciousness after 11 hours of hemodialysis, removing all the toxins from the blood. She lived more than seven years before dying of another ailment. So shown to the right is the drum, the dialysis machine, back in 1945. Now, once they've, um, once they've re recovered um, uh, from acute kidney injury, um, sometimes these patients require chronic dialysis. Back in 1961, there are many, many patients that require dialysis chronically, but there were only few machines. So somehow they had to decide who was going to get dialysis or not. This was done by the Admissions and Policies Committee of the Seattle Artificial Kidney Center at Swedish Hospital. They were also referred to as the God Committee. They decided who lived and who died. However, in 1972, the President Richard Nixon expanded Medicare coverage. Medicare is a federally funded um, uh, program to pay for patients that are over 65 years of age. It's an insurance program or those that have received dialysis. So President Nixon expanded Medicare coverage to Americans with kidney failure. This led to the rise of ESRD programs in the US. So every patient that's on dialysis can uh, receive dialysis paid for by the government. In terms of transplantation, the first transplant was done in December 23rd, 1954. This was the first successful kidney transplant. John Merrill is considered the father of nephrology. Prior transplants were unsuccessful because of immunological rejection. However, Richard Herrick, who was a 24-year-old patient with CKD and severe hypertension, received a kidney from an identical twin. The recipient had a remarkable clinical course. He got married, had two daughters. He died, however, of a myocardial infarction eight years after the transplant. But John Merrill made renal transplantation a reality and a success. However, transplants between identical twins is extraordinarily rare, and there are many, many patients who require a kidney transplant. What became possible was to have transplants in, in patients in which the kidney was not necessarily uh, HLA matched completely. What allowed that are new drugs. One of them is azathioprine. Gertrude Ellion, along with George Herbert Hitchings in 1957, discovered azathioprine. Because of this, they shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1988. 
Azathioprine was found to block DNA production and inhibit T cell proliferation. And so azathioprine suppressed the immune system, which would otherwise reject the newly transplanted organs. This was incredibly revolutionary at the time because it allowed for transplants to occur in, uh, in patients that uh, may not necessarily have a completely matched kidney. What was next was the evolution of paired exchange transplantation. That is, you might have a donor pair, a donor and a recipient, in which this person wanted to donate to this person. However, because of mismatching, this transplant cannot happen. Similarly, in another donor pair, uh, they are mismatched, and this uh, cannot happen as well. However, this donor can donate to this recipient, and vice versa, and so you can have what's called a paired exchange. You can imagine that this is going to continue to grow because you can have three pair exchange. And then, in addition to that, you can have a whole chain of donations in which you can have matching of donor and recipient. And this can be initiated by an altruistic donor, that is, a donor that just um, gives a kidney up uh, in order to make this chain operational. Recently, in the New York Times, there is a, um, uh, a news report of 30 kidneys being transplanted by these individuals. They were all involved in this donor chain and happened all at once. So things can happen, remarkable things can happen with regards to transplantation. And we can then take care of those patients that require dialysis or transplantation. Now the cost of healthcare system of treating kidney failure is really unsustainable. There are 700,000 Americans who have kidney failure they represent 1% of the Medicare population. So 1% of the Medicare population requires dialysis treatment, yet they use up 7% of the Medicare budget. So this disparity is quite evident and, and it's unsustainable. 100,000 start dialysis every year and more than 50,000 of them die within five years. And we spend $35 billion annually to cover the, Medi the Medicare dialysis program. Now, the patient survival on dialysis relative to patients with cancers is, is very poor. If one looks at the different cancers, you can see the, patient sur the percent survival of colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and ovarian cancer is much greater than those patients that have reached dialysis. What's worse than dialysis is lung cancer. Now dialysis is in existence, but it's not perfect and by far. It's unsustainable and patients end up dying as I just mentioned. However, two months ago, President Trump signed an executive order on advancing American kidney health. This was an executive order to improve the lives of patients with kidney disease. The goal was threefold, to reduce the risk of kidney failure, that is, to work upstream when patients have chronic kidney disease, or even earlier, to prevent kidney disease through education, through better blood pressure control, better nutrition, better exercise uh, programs. But all these factors are to minimize the progression of kidney disease or prevent kidney disease and avoid dialysis. Goal number two is to improve access to and quality of person-centered treatment options. What does that mean? Well, currently dialysis is done in center mostly uh, and patients have to come to the center three times per week. But what we know is that when patients are on home, home dialysis, that is, if the treatments are done at home, they do better. They're dialyzed more frequently, they dialyze maybe five times per week, and they have better outcomes. So what the emphasis is and what the incentives are is to be able to get patients to dialyze at home rather than in center. Goal number three is to increase access to kidney transplants. 
There are a number of barriers to transplantation outside of the immunological um, HLA mismatching. But to increase the access, there are a number of things that happen. First, the patient, the donor, oftentimes can't afford to stay home for two months to recover. They lose their wage pay from their job, and, and therefore they uh, elect not to donate. But this program will allow for compensation to occur so that they can stay home and still have food on their table. They also provide an option that they can have their job when they return. So there are these financial barriers that are going to be removed to allow patients to donate their kidneys so that recipients can receive a life-long uh, gift. Now, there are some landmark studies, a number of different landmark studies um, in nephrology. I'm just going to talk about a few of them. Probably the most celebrated um, landmark study is the one by Ed Lewis and the Collaborative Study Group on the effect of angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibition on diabetic nephropathy. Well, what is this? Well, from animal studies, we know that if you control um, blood pressure and pressure within the kidney with a certain kind of medication called an ACE inhibitor or converting enzyme inhibitor. Probably most patients with hypertension, even in this room, are taking such medications. You may not even know that, uh, that you're taking it in terms of um, that, that, it's, that it has a special effect. It's also a great blood pressure medication. So angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors were used to see if they can prevent or delay the progression of kidney disease because this has a special effect to lower the pressure within the kidney. This is the result of the, uh, the study. You can see on the y-axis, the upward direction it indicates worse kidney function. And this is time up to about four years. What you'll notice is that the placebo group progressed at a certain rate, but the group that was on the ACE inhibitor progressed at a slower rate, and therefore, delayed the progression of kidney disease. If you delay the dialysis by year, you save $100,000 because it costs about $100,000 a year to put someone on dialysis. And in addition to that, you've improved the patient's quality of life. Now, molecular genetics allowed us to discover different genes that are responsible for kidney disease. Peter Harris cloned the polycystic kidney disease 1 gene, which was responsible for the majority of patients with polycystic kidney disease. Steve Somlo cloned the polycystic kidney disease 2 gene, which was responsible for another group of patients that have polycystic kidney disease. With time, patients with polycystic kidney disease have an increase in growth of their kidneys up to a hundredfold. You can see that difference here. This is a normal kidney. This is one that was extracted from a patient with polycystic kidney disease. So PKD1 and PKD2 are responsible for this disorder. How it does it is under intense investigation at this time. Now, African Americans represent about 10% of the U.S. population, but they represent 30% of the dialysis population. So why is it that there is this discrepancy in the, and their overrepresentation in the dialysis population? We've oftentimes thought that this was due to socioeconomic factors, access to medical care, maybe lifestyle. But what Martin Pollock found was that there is an association between a um, molecule called ApoL1. Now, ApoL1 is a component of HDL, which is the uh, good cholesterol. And ApoL1 is toxic to trypanosomes. In Africa, trypanosomes cause what's called African-American sleeping sickness. Now, these trypanosomes, there are some variants that are unresponsive to ApoL1, and so they become resistant to it. 
Now in Africa, because of selection processes, African Americans have developed mutations in the APOL1 gene. And so you can have a G1 variant or a G2 variant. Now the G1 or G2 variant then makes the, um, uh, the um, trypanosome susceptible to APOL1, the mutant APOL1. So in an individual who has normal APOL1, they can get trypanosome infection or sleeping sickness. If you have one mutation, you are prevented from getting African American African um, sleeping sickness, and you don't have kidney disease. But if you have two copies of the mutant gene, you are prevented from getting disease, but you are susceptible to chronic kidney disease. So in African Americans, a number of studies have shown that if you have two copies, you are susceptible to kidney disease. So this has important implications because if we do these testings now and we find out that an individual has two copies, do we allow them to donate kidneys because they are susceptible to kidney disease and they might end up having dialysis themselves if they give up their kidney? So this is being worked out, but this is an important finding and one of the major discoveries in terms of uh, kidney disease in African Americans. The most recent study uh, has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine in June of 2019. And this is sure to be a landmark study. This is uh, the role of canagliflozin uh, on renal outcomes in type 2 diabetes. Now, I mentioned before that ACE inhibitors, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, was the standard of care for patients for the last 20 or 30 years uh, for patients that have diabetic kidney disease and proteinuria. Canagliflozin might change uh, this in the future. Now, canagliflozin inhibits the sodium glucose co-transporter. Matthias Hedinger and Ernst Wright back in the 1980s cloned the sodium glucose co-transporter. There are two versions, the SGLT2 and SGLT1. The SGLT2 represents 80% or 90% um, of uh, glucose transport in the kidney. So if you block this, you prevent glucose absorption, and you might improve diabetic control. But it turns out that SGLT2 inhibitors, if you block this, are not that great in terms of diabetic control. But what they found was that it had impressive effects on cardiovascular outcomes and renal outcomes. So SGLT2 inhibitors are now available for, public, for, the, for, um, for patients. And it's being prescribed quite readily now for not only diabetes control, but also for kidney disease. And this is because of the study that I just mentioned, the Creedon study. And I'll just get right to the tr chase here in that what they found was that in type 2 diabetes and kidney disease, the risk of kidney failure in cardiovascular events was lower in the canagliflozin group than in the placebo group when they had a medium, median follow-up of 2.62 years. So it's being used now for patients that have a type 2 diabetes and kidney disease. But a word of caution, and this is um, a, an editorial by Dr. Masomi Nangaku here at the University of Tokyo, in which he wanted us to be more deliberate and to be certain of what we do. What he says is that SGL2 inhibitors have not been established in patients with more advanced CKD. SGL2 inhibitors promote the excretion of large amounts of glucose, glucose, and we don't really know what that does to our metabolic system. And SGLT2s are associated with an increased risk of acidosis in type 1 diabetics. So just a word of caution. But nevertheless, this is going to become, I think, very big in the future in terms of treatment of kidney disease. Now, I want to turn our attention to transforming kidney research, discovery, innovation. This is what we need in order to make advances in the treatment of patients with kidney disease 
to ultimately provide cures for these patients. This is a quote from Bill Gates. I believe in innovation and that the way you get innovation is you fund research and you learn the basic facts. But there are barriers to innovation. There's complacency that favors dialysis as a safe landing. We've been doing this for 50 or 60 years and we've changed very little over that period of time and patients get dialyzed but they don't have great outcomes. There's a dearth of capital for translational R&D. There's just not enough money in research and development. There are few investable companies in nephrology. Very few companies are investing in kidney research. And there's no sense of urgency. This is a diagram which illustrates uh, the problem. This is called the valley of death between research resources and commercialization resources. Good ideas often fail to reach product development owing to the lack of funds. There are misaligned incentives and cultural divides. What is needed are public-private partnerships to jumpstart global innovation to capitalize or to catalyze the development of new products to address significant unmet need of kidney patients. We need to clarify regulatory and reimbursement pathways. The American Society of Nephrology and the Japanese Society of Nephrology have entered into programs, public-private partnerships, to be able to span this gap that leads to product development and uh, innovation uh, in the future. In the United States, the federal government underfunds kidney research. If one looks at the prevalence of various diseases, such as HIV and AIDS, cancer, heart disease, you can see the large numbers continue, are, are, the large numbers are much, much less than kidney disease. Now, the FY15 appropriation to support research in this area is shown here. If you calculate what the NIH spending is per patient per year, for HIV and AIDS, it's $2,500 per patient. For kidney disease, knowing that there are 40 million people in the United States with kidney disease, that amounts to $14 per patient. This is a mere $14, a paltry amount of money to support kidney disease research. Now let's go back to the patient with chronic kidney disease. Remember that this patient is asymptomatic despite the fact that there is intense uh, fibrosis of the kidney. That there are new techniques, new technologies that are, being, uh, that are being used to address kidney disease. One of the things we noticed is that with kidney, chronic kidney disease, there is what's called small vessel dropout or capillary rarefaction. You can see the blood vessels become diminished further and further out from the acute event. And this was nicely illustrated by Dr. Nangaku, which shows the paratubular capillaries in red. And you can see with chronic kidney disease that there is a loss of these capillary network. So without the capillary and without the blood flow to regions of the kidney, the kidney becomes hypoxic. And many, and fibrosis develops. Now, Dr. Hu, Song Hu, in the University of Virginia, is working on different techniques to be able to measure oxygen tension in the kidney. This is one study called photoacoustic imaging for real-time metabolism in the kidney. It starts with pulsed laser excitation to the kidney. This leads to optical absorption, transient heating. This leads to thermal elastic expansion and acoustic emission. This is then picked up by an ultrasound device which then creates an image. Now this is like an image that you get when you, get, when you use ultrasound, either in pregnancy or uh, to look at various structures in the body. This is the kind of image that you can get using this photoacoustic microscopy. These are blood vessels in the brain, in the eye, in the liver, and this is the kidney. And what you can see is that, that you can get high resolution images that also tell you functional data 
that have functional information such as oxygen saturation, oxygen extraction, metabolic rate of oxygen consumption. So this is a very important technique to be able to obtain functional data in the kidney. Now, the ability to grow organs is the future as well. And many investigators, including uh, Melissa Little, Joe Bonventry, are leading the way in terms of developing what's called organoids. And these are developed from pluripotent stem cells in which you develop structures that are very similar to the kidney with the hope that you can develop an artificial kidney that will eventually take uh, the place of what we have if we need it. It also is a ready source of cells that can be, do, can, that can be used in research. There's also the development and, excite, and excitement in terms of kidney on a chip. What this is is a microfluidic physiological system that is seeded with cells from the kidney so that you can grow proximal tubules or have glomeruli in this physiological system that you can allow for high throughput analysis and rapid testing of drugs to determine whether these drugs might be toxic to the kidney. This is um, a high resolution image that Dr. Hasegawa and Dr. Nangaku had um, published recently. To be able to visualize structures in the kidney is quite important. And in this study, what they used is a technique to delipidate and clear some of the background structures and use an antibody to be able to label the target, uh, the molecule of interest. In this first case, the antibody is used to label tyrosine hydroxylase, which is present in sympathetic neurons. So this represents sympathetic neuron innervation to the kidney. Following acute kidney injury, you can see that there is marked reduction of the sympathetic innervation to the kidney. You can use other antibodies to detect various structures in the kidney, such as collecting ducts, which is part of the kidney, other tubules, and uh, various structures such as glomeruli in the kidney. You can also use an antibody that stains fibrosis. So this is a very impressive technique uh, that, uh, is, that will allow us high resolution images, three dimensional images of the kidney. Single cell RNA-seq has become widespread, has been used wide, widely now. And in the past, we've used bulk analysis. That is, we have a heterogeneous population of cells, we grind them up, and then we can get the average gene expression. It doesn't tell us about individual cells that could be important. Now, with single cell analysis, you can separate individual cells and do the analysis on individual cells and determine different pathways of those cells. This is important not only in kidneys, but in cancer biology. Uh, and many other disciplines. In kidney disease, the microbiome is very important. The microbiome consists of about a billion bacteria in the intestine. And with chronic kidney disease, there's probably disruption of the intestinal barrier and there's translocation of molecules that can get into the systemic circulation that can then lead to inflammation, which then can lead to cardiovascular risk, chronic kidney disease. So the study of the microbiome will reveal a lot of information in the future with regards to the progression of kidney disease and perhaps give us insight as to why patients die a cardiovascular death once they have kidney disease. In the future and right now, artificial intelligence is going to be critical. There is a massive amount of clinical data that requires advanced learning systems to harness and deconvolute data. You can develop prognostic models to forecast outcomes, such as risk of kidney disease, progression of kidney disease, hospital admissions, fistula failures, response to therapies. It can be involved in medical image analysis with regards to kidney biopsy analysis or patient monitoring such as anemia management or drug dosing. 
Recently, it was published that artificial intelligence is being used to predict kidney failure in advance. So this is the future to be able to detect kidney disease early. But what's really needed was brought out by Julie Inrig in her recent publication. Improving care for patients with kidney disease will require a concerted effort to increase the scope, quality, and quantity of clinical trials within nephrology. Now, currently, some of the studies, uh, clinical studies, is depicted in this slide here. If we have 100 individuals, they're all different. And then we put them, we randomize them, and uh, they receive drug X or placebo. If we're lucky, this is the result. We have 10 patients who benefited and 90 patients who did not. So one patient benefited, but nine did not benefit from treatment. That's a success. But those nine or 90 have been exposed to the drug. Now, we need to improve our precision. We need to improve personalized medicine. At NIH, there's a kidney precision medicine project that has been funded and ongoing now. The goal is over the next 10 or 15 years to understand and treat human disease, to ethically obtain uh, and safely obtain kidney biopsies with patients who have acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease, to find disease subgroups and to stratify these subgroups, find disease pathways in key cells, to devise individualized treatments, and to improve scientific knowledge and to improve the pipeline of drugs. So this is the P kidney medicine project. It's to bank tissue and to, uh, from ethically and safely obtained kidney biopsies, learn tissue, digital pathways, to be able to evaluate markers on tissues, find cellular pathways, create a tissue atlas. So remember, this is the personalized case, or this is the case that I mentioned, in which nine patients were exposed to drug, did not benefit, and one patient benefited. Now, when we apply our various precision tools, such as genomics, RNA sequencing, proteomics, metabolomics, biomarkers, and clinical data, we can then evolve into clinical trials in which we have specific treatments for specific disorders and different targets. So we have drug X, drug Y, and drug Z that patients would benefit from. So this is what we want to do, is to provide personalized treatment. So overcoming barriers in cl clinical trials, we need to understand, first of all, that mouse and humans are important, but they are different. A mouse is not a human. We need to find physiologically relevant targets. We need to invest and find good animal models. We need to rigorously conduct preclinical studies. We need to use biomarkers, functional studies, biopsy samples, and genetic samples, design better clinical trials. The Kidney Precision Medicine Project will likely be of help in the future. So I'd like to end on two quotes. First, innovation is a pirate ship that sails into a yacht club. You might have to think about that for a minute. The next quote, I'm proud to call nephrology my profession. We should try to make nephrology not just great, but good. But it can't be great unless it is also good. This is a quote from Jim Ryan, the president of the University of Virginia, in his inaugural address on October the 19th, 2018. This is the University of Virginia in the springtime, and this is the Division of Nephrology at the University of Virginia. So I'll stop there, and again, thank you for this terrific honor, and uh, it's, it's probably one of the, um, the highlights of my career to be here today. So thank you so much.